it over with. <laughs> Thank you very much. If, if anyone has any questions, I'd be very, very happy to answer them. I, 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 wanna, I, mean, I haven't read the book yet. Oh, well, that can soon be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that moment of going to Coventry, what were the circumstances then you said to leave that? The reason why I went to Coventry, I went to Coventry to go to Lanchester Polytechnic. It's now Coventry University. Yeah, and, and, and how did you find that in um, the, when you first entered those Well, I, I was the only um, black kid in my school, and I ended up at Lanchester Polytechnic being the only black kid there as well. Um, there were a couple of other black people, but they were on sandwich courses, as they were called at the time, which meant that you spent a lot of time in, in you know, some other work facility and then you just came back just to do exams and maybe, so every now and again, I would see like maybe, I don't know, three African students wandering around and we say hello <laughs> to each other and things like that, you know, it's, it's like that, I, I don't know what it, it was like for you, but I know when I've gone around doing these readings that um, I've come across a lot of, uh, uh, of, of black people who sort of said during the 70s, when black people first started turning up on the television, because they weren't really on the television much before, only in movies or whatever, that uh, as soon as a black person was on the television, everyone would suddenly jump up and sort of, you know, go and shout upstairs, come down, come down, there's a black person on the television, and things like this, you see. Yeah. So, I mean, it must have been, but well, I, I didn't really realise that, not growing up in a black family, but I, I, I do very much remember whenever I saw a movie, it was like, wow, there's a black person on there. You know, there might be being a maid or something like that, but nonetheless, there was a black yeah. person in the movie. How do you find that about today, the representation of then um, black people? In the media, because I still find it's it's not it's not portrayed as still positives in today's society. I find it, there's a lot more positives now than there were, say, back in the um, 80s uh, when I first started, you know, doing some acting and and, and being in things on the box. Mm. Very much then, you were a cipher. I mean, goodness me, you couldn't have a black and white person kissing each other, and you couldn't really even have two black people kissing each other on the television. That it was, you know, the, in inverted commas, that might offend people. But now we have um, the, uh, the Olympics, yeah. uh, the, what do you call that? The opening ceremony. That was the thing that Danny Boyle did. It was just an absolute revelation. I mean, that man should get a knighthood and every other hood that there is going. Um, because uh, I, I just feel that, you know, he was right on the button. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was portraying the Britain that all of us can see out on the street today um, and really go for that whole kind of multiculturalism thing. Um, and that's why I I kind of found, I suppose, you know, our, our great leader, David Cameron, um, so mealy mouthed because it was like, yeah, the Olympics went real well. Um, so they take all the credit for that. But I can categorically say that uh, in 2011, the early part of 2011, um, the very same man had, had announced that multiculturalism was completely dead and wasn't working. And those were his words. And it patently is working. And even if it isn't working, we ain't got no choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Also wrote, uh, he was a doctor as well, mm -hmm. who also wrote about her experience mm -hmm. with that. And I wondered if you. My father was dead, right. hers was alive. Right. So uh, I missed him by a year and a half, okay. which was um, uh, most unfortunate for both of us, obviously. Um, I, I didn't know my father, but he was, he was quite prolific, put it that way. So I then found myself the oldest of 17 siblings. And, uh, and he had, um, I don't know, the, the numbers vary, but between five and eight wives. Um, and um, so I found out a lot about him. And I've also found a lot of people who look like me, <laughs> um, either here or I have a half sister who her mother is Swiss. Um, and cousins and things, you know, who are um, also mixed race. <laughs> so uh, my father and one of my uncles came over to Britain in the early 50s to study um, at the university 
in, um, or one of the universities in London. <coughs> and uh, there he met my mother, um, who, uh, she took him home to, if anyone knows London at all, to a place called Dagnam Heathway, which is a bit of a place in the middle of nowhere. And she was only about, I don't know, she must have been about 16, maybe 17 at that time. And, uh, and her, when I, I, I asked her about, you know, what was it like when you met my dad? She said, oh, he followed me home. And she said, I knew I couldn't take him home to see me mum and dad. <laughs> that was what she would say on the subject. So quite where I was conceived, I don't know. <laughs> no, I haven't been to Africa yet. I haven't been to Africa yet. Um, I am in touch with um, my family there. Um, but I... There's quite a lot of us, if you know what I mean, sort of others of us obviously around and we kind of turn up, I suppose, like bad pennies all the time. <laughs> um, so you have to be, feel fairly comfortable, I feel, and, and um, to go. And I, I, there's nothing to go to because his generation have mainly died now. So the generation below him, um, don't really know who the hell I am particularly. But, but like I say, you know, Facebook and all these wonderful social network sites now make a plane journey and the glories of Lagos Airport <laughs> not necessary <laughs> yet. <laughs> Hello. Um, the first one is completely hypothetical. I mean, any of us, you know, that's the wonder of being a child, isn't it, or, or, or a baby. You, you just get born and you're with who you're with, and you get on with it. And that's the amazing thing about the resilience of children. They can kind of, you know, make do and mend, as it were. Um, whether I would be the same person, I don't really know. <laughs> I've seen photos of my father and I've heard about my father. And, and I know that there's an awful lot of him in me. Apparently he was quite mad. <laughs> and uh, I'm very outgoing. And my mother is also very similar. Um, she was very outgoing. And when I actually ended up meeting my mother, there were just things that we both do the same. And neither of us had seen any. I, well, you know, there was no connection at all for a long, long period of time, ever since I was four weeks old, when she gave me up for adoption. And just silly things, just silly things, like, you know, the way, the way you stand, the way you um, say certain words, all of those things. And, and none of that could be accounted for in any other way. Um, I used to think that it was all about nurture, but I suppose then I have to go with, you know, that some of it is nature. Was that only the first question? Yeah. What was the, the second? Is, do you like oh, do I like who I? Oh gosh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever since I, I I went on that journey and actually found out who my parents were, and it there is something. I mean, that's why I say it is a little bit like kind of having your soul ripped out of you because you actually don't know your real identity, and it may be really, really kind of. It's something absolutely fundamental to those who are born to the parents that they're born to and they grow up and they have all that history with them. But when you don't do that, um, you feel it quite deeply and quite strangely. Um, and it's not something that you walk around with and you're feeling all the time. But every now and again there'd be a program on the television about somebody who had gone looking for their parents and they'd either found them, they had a good experience, a bad experience or whatever. And at the end of it, I'd be interested all the way through, and by the end of it, I'd just be blubbing like a small child. And, and it wasn't like blubbing because of anything that had moved me in the program. I was just blubbing because I needed that to happen to me. And, um, and when it did, it was, uh, you know, you, you, you just get on with it. It's not all perfect. It's not that everybody loves you when you turn up, believe me. Um, or that you're even that, um, what's the word, you know, that it changes you in some deep, deep way. 
but you just settle, and that's the only word that I can say. You just settle. There's something in you that just settles, and you're on a level then. And yeah, it kind of puts you back in the human race. Why does anyone leave anything so long? I think that some things are, are emotionally, you have to reach the right place where you can actually deal with what's going to happen. Um, you don't know the outcome. It's not like all rosy or whatever. I mean, you have to take what turns up. And it ain't just your mother that's going to turn up, and it ain't just your father that's going to turn up. All these other people come with them. And it's that, I feel, that a lot of adopted people, when they go searching for their parents, forget that mothers and fathers do not come singly. They then have a whole history. Um, and it's easier to do when you're older because more time has gone by and people deal with things much better when they're older than I could have turned up probably when I was 18. But when I was 18, my mother would only have been 36. Um, she might not have been too happy to have found me on her doorstep with a lot of explaining to do. Um, but she was at the right age when I did appear. So that's an answer to that. two-tone tour, yes. Um, we were all young and uh, we were all sort of carving out a path or whatever. I, um, but then it's the vagaries really of the music business. Everybody had to go their separate ways. We were very idealistic. Jerry Downs, who formed the specials and was the founder of Two-Tone really, um, is a very eccentric man. He's also very idealistic. Um, and we bought into that idealism. I still feel that idealism about it. Um, it's, it's one of those things. But the music business, there's nothing idealistic about the music business. Um, and very soon we kind of found ourselves out of kilter, I suppose, with the rest of the country who were all moving towards wearing kilts and ballet slippers and strange sort of things like that. Um, and worked until they were muscle bound, and uh, that caused us some degree of consternation. <laughs> Pauline, can I just ask, sorry, you mentioned two tone, obviously, you sort of hinted at the new romantics then. What have you thought about the various musical movements that have come since two tone? And then, of those musical movements, have any of them had anything to say, anything serious to, to say, do you think? Um, I mean, a lot of musical movements have come along. I, I don't feel that since the, the 70s are much maligned as, as, a, as a time. People look back to the 60s and say that everything happened in the 60s. Well, yes, it did, but also a lot happened in the 70s. And punk happened in the 70s. It might have not been everybody's cup of tea, but it really did break down the walls of all kinds of things and it opened up young white people's ears to black music in this country, reggae music in particular. Um, and suddenly you'd got poets coming along, you know, like Linton Kwesi Johnson, um, and, um, and John Cooper Clark. They were there, and you know, we, we, we were sharing stages with them and things like this. And by the time we came along, and, and, and of course there'd been Clash before, um, it was, people were ready to listen to a hybrid of all those kinds of music um, with us, Madness, Specials, The Beat, The Body Snatchers. It was all kind of going on in that way. And, and also we had a, a social agenda and, and a political agenda for the time. And that kind of got quashed after that. Um, Thatcher came along. Um, Thatcher stuck the boot in after two years and we all know what happened there. Um, not many lessons were learned when I look at today. And it was, to my mind, two-tone was arguably the last social movement that actually happened in music. After that, it was kind of style 
um, I won't say fashion, there's nothing wrong with fashion, but they, they were kind of stylistic things, you know, like the cool Britannia sort of thing and, 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 and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I champion alternative music. I'm not going to be one of those old people who stands around saying, hey, music's not like it was in my day. I mean, thank God. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine who was around in, 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 in our day. And also the 70s wasn't all us, you know, I mean, you've got Gary Glitter and God knows who else um, around at that time. So, uh, so yeah, it's, um, that's how I feel about the 70s. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I do ramble a lot. <laughs> Pauline, I, uh, I saw you, what must be about four or five years ago, in Leicester at the Wild Theatre doing your... Uh, oh, Selector Acoustic, were you there? No, it was, this was when you did the um, Billy oh. Holiday and Nina Simone. Yes, we were there. Yeah. Which was, you know, a lot of people tamper with that music and don't do it very well, but it was a fantastic evening and you had great Thank stories you. to tell about both women. The question behind that is, an excellent book, um, some great music with Selector, obviously, um, the jazz thing that you touched on there. Where to in the future? Are you just going to go where the muse takes you, or have you got things that you want to accomplish definitely in terms of music and sort of literature and other things? Um, well, I mean, one of the things is that uh, myself and the original singer from The Selector have got back together again, and we're playing the Lesser O2 tonight, um, if everyone wants to come. And, um, and we've, uh, we recorded an album um, last year, which came out this year, and we're in the process of recording another album, which will come out next year. We're off to Australia and America next year, so it's, there's plenty to do. I mean, as long as I can kind of stand up, don't need a Zimmer frame or any of those kind of things, then I don't really envisage, um, you know, it's, uh, I just take things as, as they come, really, rather than worry about what, what's going on. If some enlightened, sorry, just to indulge you with one more question, if, uh, if some enlightened TV executive offered you black on black again, would you take that or would you say enough is enough on there that? There aren't any enlightened TV executives. <laughs> 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 we live in um, I don't think the country needs a black on black these days. Um, I think there are black presenters on TV um, and um, there are, you know, it's, it's not so much there are just black issues these days that are black. We're all involved in, in it these days, and I, I, what I would like to see is more, kind of, across the board, you know, the, uh, of um, not just the ones here and there. Um, but I, I don't really see the point in having um, a program like Black on Black um, these days. For anyone who isn't old enough, um, is that old enough or young enough? I don't know, but whichever way it is. Um, I, I presented a show called Black on Black, which was one of the first kind of black magazine programs on TV. This was during the middle of the 80s, um, and I, I did it with um, Beverly Anderson, who was um, there, and Trevor Phillips, who some people might know from the campaign um, uh, racial equality um, leader. Um, and it was, it had a niche at that time, because the riots had happened during the early 80s, and black people were really, I, I, I just feel that they, they felt that they needed to be represented on television. Um, believe me, I'm not saying that I was the best representative in the world, but I was all that they had at the time that I could actually go on, on telly. And, uh, and out of that came all kinds of other people, Craig Charles, Kathy Tyson, all of those people, Victor Romero, Evans, all had their start on that program. Um, but it was a magazine program, so you had to deal with everybody, really, from the age of about seven through to about 70, um, and you were not going to please everybody. Um, and the main remit at that time was probably kind of um, to, to, you know, sort of the interests of people from the Caribbean. But what it did uh, do, I feel, is get those new stories out there. And if there were stories um, about black people, then we had them on there. Like, I remember covering a story, it's in the book as well, about going out and covering the Democratic Convention in 1984 when Jesse Jackson was trying to be um, nominated for um, President of the United States. And it was like then, everybody was just laughing at poor old Jesse Jackson. Like, well, that's never going to happen. 
And, and you know, and I was sent out there to interview people and, and, and cover this, and completely thrown in at the deep end, but got to meet all these amazing people like Coretta Scott King and, and um, you know, um, Senator Bond. I'd never met of a senator before, let alone a black one, so I mean, this was like incredible. Um, and here we are, sitting here, what, not even getting on for uh, 30 years later, and there's, um, you know, President Obama in the, in the White House, which at that time you could never, ever, ever have envisaged, because Black on Black, it was strictly a niche program, it was stuck on at 11 o'clock at night, so everybody had gone to bed, and not only that, it wasn't even weekly, it was fortnightly, and we shared it with a sister program called East and I, which was for Asian people. Um, and uh, those were very, very different days, and, and you know, it's just not the same days now at all. I did ramble on there, didn't I? No, good answer. Any more questions at all? There's someone at the back there. I'm not opposed to transracial adoption. I'm not opposed to adoption. Um, although it might sound as though I'm opposed to adoption. Um, sometimes there is no, what would you rather have happen? A child languish in a home, uncared for, um, in you know, the conventional sense of having two parents. Um, or would you have them in a situation where they have other siblings? Um, or you know, people that they can call siblings, children, either older or younger than them and a two-parent family, and have their needs, um, and a loving home. I'm not going to deny any child that, just because I had a strange experience. My parents loved me. But you can love someone, and not necessarily do the right things by them. My parents weren't able to do the right things by me, because of ignorance. And I mean ignorance in the best sense of the word. I do not mean ignorance in the sense that, you know, they were willfully ignorant. They did not know. Nobody knew at that time. Most um, adoption agencies at that time, if they were going to um, send a child out to, to a white family, they kind of expected that child to be brought up as a white child. Nobody was telling them how to do, you know, even stupid things like how to do their hair, how to clean their knees, you know, or any of the other things that you have to do. Uh, you know, like plait hair or any of those kind of stuff. Um, so all of those things that they didn't know how to deal with because they didn't know any black people, so they couldn't ask them. I doubt whether they would have asked them anyway. Um, you, you, you're just left to kind of suffer. Um, and you have to learn this years later. Um, and then, of course, when you do start meeting um, other uh, black people or other black families, they think that you're retarded in some way because you don't know about this, that or the other. Um, and so it's like you've got to learn two different sets of ways of being in the world and take flack from both sides quite often, which is annoying rather than, you know, it's just life. But I mean, it's annoying sometimes. Um, I certainly was back then. So all I'm saying is if you were going to have transracial adoption, then Everybody has to be on board from the birth parents or birth parent, depending on the circumstances, to the um, adoptive parents. They have to know that there is somebody that they can go to for questions to be answered. If there are going to be problems in the growing up of that child, when they start asking questions, all of those kind of things, they have to be serviced. And I'm afraid that David Cameron I do not think is in the business of that. I believe David Cameron wishes to empty the children's homes because that saves money. Now that is a contentious thing to say, I know, but it's what I think. Thank you very much. Maybe over there. Um, I read your book and I really enjoyed it. Very interesting. I just have one question. Um, well, first of all, when you 
No, I never felt any anger towards her at all. Um, I had a good idea of probably what she went through. I mean, she was 17, she was pregnant. Um, and uh, she was pregnant with a mixed race child in 1953. Uh, it's not a good combination. Um, and in Essex, an even worse combination. Um, and. You know, as, as a fellow woman, I could completely understand that. I had a little bit more kind of uh, anguish about my father. Um, he was actually married at the time when he was fathering me. Um, and it's, um, I feel that, you know, he probably needed a good slap around the head and told not to be uh, whatever, but um, that's, that's by the by. Um, so no, I had no animosity towards her at all. Um, I would have liked to have known more about things, but it's like, how much do you pry into somebody's life and things that they had kind of put behind them? And um, you have to tread quite delicately around other people's feelings. Um, and that, that's a tricky one because it's, yeah, that's a tricky one. I'm not the most considered person in the world sometimes, <laughs> maybe in book form. <laughs> Personally, I think we all blurt things out sometimes that maybe we would... Uh, Maybe not blurt out in other circumstances. Okay, there's somebody with their hand up at the back there. That's time for more question. I'm really dead, so. I can relate. Oh, there you are. It's a bit better. It's a bit over the top, but no, that's good. I like that. Okay. I can relate a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Just to say, once again, thank you very much to Pauline Black and thank you very much everybody for coming.